Good morning, saints, and welcome to our Sunday morning uh, Bible study. Uh, today we're basking in the sunshine of the Transfiguration. You know, this uh, signals the end of the season of Epiphany, and it sends us directly into the season of Lent, uh, with Ash Wednesday coming up this Wednesday. So, saints, today we're going to continue with our study of the Acts of the Apostles. Today we're looking at chapter 3. And we're going to see Peter, John, and the lame man sitting there by a beautiful gate and later listen to Peter's great message uh, at Solomon's Colonnade. So saints, let's bow our heads in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the giving of the Spirit. And O oh Holy Spirit, we thank you that now you will teach us what we need to learn about calling upon you, about boldness in sharing the gospel, and about understanding how you answer the prayers of those who believe. So Lord, give me wisdom, give all of us understanding, help all of us to apply it to our daily living, and oh God, give me clarity of speech and accuracy of interpretation. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. So, saints, if you open up your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 3, uh, we'll be reading from the New King James Version. <clears throat> now, what is Acts chapter 3 all about? Well, the Lord Jesus now has ascended into heaven, and all of his followers have received the promised Holy Spirit. They are, all of the believers, in the beginning stages of their mission and their missions, mission beginning in Jerusalem. The Lord said, you will be my witnesses in, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So they're beginning their mission now in Jerusalem. Last week we saw on the day of Pentecost, they witnessed uh, to all the Jews who were gathered from all over the Roman Empire. And as a result, their group of 120 that were in the upper room have now grew to be over 3,000. In Acts 3, however, Peter and John come to the temple for the evening prayer, which was 3 p.m., which they said the ninth hour, the same time, by the way, the Lord Jesus died on the cross. While entering the gate of the temple, known as Beautiful, because the uh, gate that led into the temple had beautiful gold and silver plating on it, they came upon a lame man begging for alms or begging for money. Uh, he had been brought there. He had been lame all the days of his life. In other words, he was handicapped, unable to walk. They, uh, they seek to help him, but they know they have nothing uh, they can give him. They have, as Peter said, no money, no silver or gold. As believers empowered by the Spirit, Peter and John, they now have the ability to provide help beyond what the other worshipers can provide. They can only give silver or gold or monies, but these two can do much more. In the name of Jesus, they healed the man and caused the man to walk. And as they walked into uh, the temple, the man gave praise to God and the people were amazed by it all right there by Solomon's colony, the kind of outer uh, uh, gates or outer, uh, um, I guess you would call them pillars that lead into the inner temple, that out there in that temple space, uh, that uh, Peter then proclaimed the risen Christ. So let's take a look in more detail at this wonderful book, the book of Acts chapter 3. And we're going to first of all read verses 1 through 10. Verse 1 reads, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. They continued uh, to worship as Jewish people, although they were Christians. They went at the ninth hour, the afternoon prayer in the temple. I said evening, but afternoon, and it was 3 p.m. 2. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried. That means from birth he was unable to walk whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. They laid him there, and I mentioned because the gold, the gold and silver plated door that was by the temple, to ask aims, alms, pardon me, from those who entered the temple. 
asking gifts often as we you know stop at red lights we have we see pre people outside with the cardboard notes uh, seeking really seeking alms to help them live by the way this gate was between the court of the Chen Gentiles and uh, actually it led from the court of the Gentiles to the court of the women in other words if you were entering into the Jewish temple at that time there was a court of the Gentiles where Gentiles could go they couldn't go beyond that then that led into the court of the women only women could go there and then it, that led into the court of the Jews where the men could go and then from that there was the inner court where only the priest or high priest even went to Holy of Holies once a year. Would see three who seeing Peter and John, some of us would say he saw someone. It's like we think when someone comes up to us, other people walk by and they see us and they think, well, he must be the one. Well, for some reason, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for alms. He had a good sense that Peter and John would give. I shouldn't have said for some reason this was the hand of God. And verse 4, and fixing his eyes on him, uh, he wanted the undivided attention of this man, uh, fixing his eyes on him with John and Peter. It says, uh, they said, look at us. They wanted once again his undivided attention. And verse 5, he gave them his attention expecting to receive something from them. That means he focused his eyes directly on Peter and John. 6, Peter speaks up. Then Peter says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. In other words, Peter knew what the man really needed. He needed more than money. He needed eternal life. And God raised him up his legs so he would know to praise God. And from that step, he would get to know God even closer. You see, it wasn't Peter that had this man healed. It was Peter's faith in the risen Christ that healed him. And verse 7, And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Peter lifted the man, lifted him up. Peter's faith healed this man. In verse 8, And he, the man, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, with Peter and John, walking, leaping, and praising God. He did not forget to praise God. In other words, his being by the gate was more than for alms. He knew this is where people go to worship God, and of course, he must have had faith to receive it. In verse 9, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. In other words, all came to realize, all would come to know the source of his healing. God had brought them there, just like Pentecost. In verse 10, And they knew that it was he who, was, who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. They had seen him there for years. They knew he was not a fraud. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to them. The people were amazed at what had happened and could not deny the miracle. Amen. Amen. So we see God works and God's plan is being fulfilled. And so now we look at verses 11 through 16. The next verse, verse 11. And as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch which is called Solomon's greatly amazed in other words they were awestruck they were dumbfounded and Solomon's portico colonnade was the roof porch that ran along the temple around the temple court you see this was the hour of evening prayer and sacrifice some I've said afternoon but it's both and a lot of people were there they were there and the people there now saw the miracle they began to see the result of what God really can do and uh, and the next verse verse 12 and when Peter saw it meaning he saw all these people amazed and astounded he took the initiative he responded to the people he said men of Israel meaning to remind them that they were chosen to be receivers of God's written revelation. Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Why are you awestruck? 
or why look so intently at us as though by our own power of godliness we had made this man walk. It was not us that healed him. You should know that. Don't admire us. Acknowledge the Savior, the source of this miracle. And he's going to mention that beginning in verse 13. He said, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, okay, our God, glorified his son Jesus. Glorified meaning he accepted Jesus, okay. He, he glorified Jesus, meaning he resurrected him whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate. God glorified him, but you rejected him. You denied them. Peter and John were identifying who they really were. And verse 14 oh, it says, And you denied the presence of Pilate, in the presence of Pilate, the governor, when you were determined to let him go. Okay? When he was determined, Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. And Pilate wanted to let him go. Verse 14, but you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. You gave up the Son of the living God and you demanded that Barabbas, a killer, a murderer, and an inside a riotous man, that he be given to you. And 15, and killed the Prince of Life. You killed the one who would give eternal life to everyone, including you. Whom God has raised from the dead, you killed him, but it didn't stop God's power, of which we are witnesses, meaning Peter, John, and all the others. We are apostles sent ones to tell of God's mercy, to say that Jesus lives. And verse 16, and his name through faith in his, in other words, we are witnesses, uh, and his name drove through faith in his name has made this man strong. In other words, he's saying we're witnesses of Christ, we're witnesses of the power of his name, we're witnesses of his resurrection so that we can tell you our story, not of what we heard or what someone else uh, has witnessed to us. We're telling you what we saw. Through faith in his name has made this man strong. Faith in the risen Christ heals, it restores, it resurrects. Whom you see and know, Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of all of you. The name of Jesus has authority, saints. It has power. So when you call upon it, call upon his grace and mercy, we receive the results of that power and grace. And continuing in verse 17, And now, brethren, I know that you did it through ignorance, as did also your rulers. In other words, you should have known about Jesus. He was proclaimed by the prophets years and years before. You should have known, but you had not studied. You had not poured your time over the scriptures. You did not learn the scriptures. And neither did your rulers. You were ignorant, but you were not innocent. Verse 18. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of his prophets, okay, God proclaimed this through the prophets years and years before, 700 years and more, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. In other words, God wants them to repent. God wants them to turn back from their sins. God is saying Christ is the fulfillment of my plan. And this is what Peter is proclaiming. And in verse 19, he says, repent. In other words, repent, ask forgiveness, therefore, and be converted. Have faith in Jesus that your sins may be blotted out, wiped away, so that times of refreshing or peace, joy, and comfort with God may come from the presence of the Lord. When the Lord comes, he will offer forgiveness. It comes a second time. In verse 20, that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before. When Jesus comes again, he will have a blessing of eternal life if they just repent. And verse 21, whom heaven must receive until the time of the restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his prophets since the world began. In other words, the second coming, this will be the last judgment. It will be the removal of sin from the world. Those who believe will have eternal life, and those who do not believe will be condemned. 
It's the Lord's personal presence uh, will come among them. And when he says, uh, when, when whom heaven must receive until the time of the restoration, Jesus has ascended into heaven, and that's where he, his physical presence will stay until he comes again. His spiritual presence are among us through his Holy Spirit. And verse 22, for Moses truly said to the fathers, <clears throat> Moses prophesied the coming Messiah. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up from you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says. In other words, Jesus Christ is both a prophet, uh, meaning that Jesus speaks the words of God, but he is also a deliverer who would take God's people out of the bondage of sin like Moses took the people out of the bondage of Egypt. And 23, and it will come to pass that every soul who will not hear the prophet, hear Jesus, will be utterly destroyed from among the people. Those who, who reject Jesus will be condemned. That's why we preach the law and its severity in the gospel and all of its sweetness. And verse 24, Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold these days. They foretold of the com promised Messiah. And 25, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with all people, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth will be blessed. In other words, God promised Abraham that his seed, the Jewish people, would bless all the families of the world through the Christ. And our final verse, verse 26. To you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquity. So in other words, Jesus' salvation, the message of his death and resurrection, first went to the Jewish people because they were the promised seed and are of Israel, of Abraham. But then through them would, would come the promise being proclaimed to the rest of us Gentiles, the world. So here we see uh, God fulfilling his plan in that Peter and John are simply moving forth on what the Lord had, had done for them. And so that the world will know as the Lord taught them for three years. Amen. So that's, that's briefly how we go through that chapter. But what does that chapter mean for all of us? Well, we have four little lessons or lessons that we can apply. There are plenty in these verses, but these are four that I think can apply so much to us as believers in Christ. The first one is don't forget to praise God when he answers our prayers. Please note when the man in the name of Christ uh, or when Peter, in the name of Christ, healed the lame man in the gate, what did the lame man do? He leaped up, he stood, and he walked. Entering the temple with Peter and John, he praised the Lord as he leaped up, stood, and walked. Let us not ever forget the Lord's mercy and his grace in response to our sincere request, the things he does for us when we were down and he lifted us up. When we didn't have the strength to stand firm and he gave us that strength. When we didn't feel like walking and God enabled us to walk. Giving God thanks for that and for everything that he does through Christ. So that's the first thing. Don't forget to praise God when we have the answer to our prayers. Second lesson. We should ask the Lord to give us courage to share the gospel when opportunities arise to do so. You see this with Peter and John, especially Peter not being afraid to speak the truth to people who could stone them and kill them. You see, after Peter healed the lame man and large crowds of people witnessed it and were amazed, Peter then took the advantage of the moment to witness to all the people the wondrous gift of God in Christ Jesus, the Son of God, whom he had he and whom he uh, told them the truth, uh, whom they had rejected. He admonished them, but God accepted the sacrifice of his son for all the sins of the world, including them. Let us then, following Peter's example, not be fearful of people, but to take advantage of every opportunity to witness Christ and to pray the Lord give them the boldness to do this.
Amen. Third lesson. The name of Jesus has power and authority. We know the Lord uh, raised uh, this lame man through Peter speaking in the name of Jesus. Saints Peter witnessed the fact that he did not heal the lame man. He simply boldly proclaimed through the power of the Holy Spirit the name of Jesus, the risen Christ, to heal this man. He was stating plainly that the name of Jesus has great power and authority. And we all should be very careful how we use this name, how we say it, and give it all the honor that it deserves. And that's the reason why when we pray, we say in the name of Jesus. Whatever we do, the scriptures say, do in the name of Jesus. Okay. And our fourth lesson, it is very important for us to spend time daily in God's word like we're doing now to properly give a witness to the world of the risen Christ because we need to know God's word. We need to know how to apply it and the Holy Spirit works with us as we search his word. Peter reminded the people at the gate that the prophets had proclaimed the coming and work of Jesus Christ many years beforehand. He tells them they should have known who Jesus was, but were not, but were ignorant of it. And by faith and courage, he went on to say that Jesus was the fulfillment of Scripture, but they had refused to study and learn the Scriptures. Therefore, they were ignorant of who Jesus was, but they were not innocent. Let us now not make the same mistake. Let us take time, let us take time daily to study so we can witness properly of the risen Christ. Amen. Amen. So those are our four lessons for today. Don't forget to praise God when he answers our requests. We should ask the Lord to give us courage to share the gospel when opportunities arise to do so. And the name of Jesus has power and authority. And finally, it is very important for us saints to spend time daily in God's word to properly give a good witness to the world that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for us, that he died for our sins to be forgiven, and he arose again, giving us eternal life with God. Amen. So before we turn off, before we're done uh, this morning, just to mention once again that uh, uh, there's only one eternal life. There's only one way to heaven. That's belief in Jesus Christ. The way to do it is simply what Peter said, repent of your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus and you will have eternal life. Every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock we have worship and we let people in at 1030. So if you'd like to come, please come and join us. We have a good time in the Lord and we study God's word. You will have to follow CDC guidelines. I know the state of Illinois is saying, I think by the beginning of next month, uh, you don't have to wear a mask, but we're asking people to still wear a mask and we're still taking temperatures and uh, still six foot spacing people because it's still out there. And then finally, to, to remind you again, if you didn't know on our Facebook page, we do have the midweek schedule for Lent. And uh, this coming Wednesday, March 2nd, we will have uh, the beginning of our Journey with Joseph series of worship services beginning at St. Philip. Here at St. Philip, uh, 7 p.m. worship begins. We'll have communion and the imposition of the ashes. So you are welcome to come and worship with us and receive a message from uh, Pastor Jeff Howes, a really good preacher. He is the uh, pastor of a St. Paul Lutheran Church at 76 in Dorchester. So saints, God bless you. Thank you for sharing time with us and hope to see you in a moment uh, when we uh, have our message for this Transfiguration Sunday. God go with you and bless you. Hope to be with you or to see you soon.